What's happening guys? My name is Nicholas Renault and in this video I'm going to be answering your deepest, darkest data science questions. Ready to do it? Let's get to it. So there were actually a ton of questions that came through that you guys asked that I threw up on the community tab. If you missed out, don't stress, just throw up your new questions. I'm get, probably gonna make this a little bit more of an interactive series so that we get a bunch of questions answered. That being said, I'm gonna answer the first batch of questions in this video, and then we'll probably have a follow-up where we answer the rest. So without further ado, let's kick this thing off. Now the first question, and this comes from an awesome subscriber by the name of Nico M. How do you see the job market evolving in regards to machine learning and data science in general over the next few years? I feel like the need for vanilla data analysts and data scientists is getting smaller with every passing year and the jobs revolving around methodologies like ML, DevOps are getting more and more attention. I think you're right and this is something that I'm seeing each and every day. The most valuable data scientists are not just generic data scientists or people that have learned the practice, but it's the ones that have industry knowledge. So having deep technical expertise, but also knowing a lot about the industry that they're planning on working in is going to serve them a lot longer and allow them to get those really juicy data science opportunities. But also to that second point, machine learning and DevOps is obviously becoming ridiculously important, but also machine learning operations. So the ability to build machine learning pipelines and have those machine learning models productionized is becoming increasingly important. Those are the, a lot of the opportunities that I'm seeing out there at the moment, but also you've got things that surround data science. So the guys that are building the applications off of those machine learning applications and the ones that are doing all the data pre-processing. So the data engineers are also in ridiculously high demand. I think there's still going to be demand for data analysts and data scientists and people that do technical development in years to come. Just what that looks like is probably gonna get refined over time. So our second question, and this comes from David Sithole. Do you ever implement machine learning models based on research papers? If yes, how do you go about it? I sometimes feel like there's not enough detail in the paper to be able to reproduce results. So I do try to implement machine learning models based on research papers, but oftentimes it's not just the research paper that I'm referring to, because as you said, there isn't always enough detail to be able to reconstruct that model from scratch. But I do try to build them, and sometimes I'll try to recreate as close to state of the art as possible, but a lot of the times that's just not feasible because you need a ridiculous amount of infrastructure. So typically what I'll do is I'll look at the paper as a guide and I'll reference the architecture as a guide, but then I'll build a model based on the infrastructure that I've got available to me and based on realism. So if they've got a loss function, which is going to be 500 lines of code to implement, well maybe I'll take a look and see whether or not there's a slightly simpler loss function or a slightly simpler layer transformation that I can implement just so I can get the model up and working. From there, if I find that I'm getting less than great performance, I'll start refining and try to get closer to what they've built in state of the art. Uh, Papers with Code is actually a great resource to go and take a look at if you're looking for best practice implementations, because you can actually just go through to GitHub and find people that have already developed those specific models, and it's actually ranked based on the number of stars, which is usually a good indicator as to the performance of that particular code base. All right, our next question, this comes from Andrew. Is there a systematic approach to tuning models in general? E.g. increase the episodes, tweak the reward function or modify a parameter like learning rate and checking whether or not our MSE drops. So by default, the first thing that I'm taking a look at is ensuring that I've got the right metrics to evaluate the model performance. So this means, am I using a specific accuracy metric? Do I need to look at precision or recall? Then I'm training a baseline model. From there, I'll determine what I need to do. If I'm finding that the model isn't fitting well on the training data, well, I'll take a look and see whether or not we need a more sophisticated neural network. If I'm finding that it's working well on training data, but it isn't working well on testing data, then I'll take a look to see whether or not we need some regularization. If we then go and deploy it and the model still isn't performing well, well, then we need to take a look at our entire data set to determine whether or not the population is matching what we've actually gone and used to train our model to begin with. Outside of that, I'll also take a look at optimization frameworks. So you might've seen me use Optuna in the 
think it was the Street Fighter video. So that's another great framework that you can use to optimize your machine learning models. And this includes doing things like uh, the number of units in a layer, the number of layers themselves, different type of activation functions, so on and so forth. But normally I'll start off with a model that's already been trialed and tested and that I know works. Great way to find those is to take a look at different deep learning and res or different research papers out there. So you have a baseline idea as to whether or not you're going to be able to achieve this task to begin with. On to question four. This is coming from David Bell. So I watched some of your video on NLP using sentiment classification. What are some of the other use cases for NLP besides classification? Well, I don't know if you've heard me say this before, but computer vision was being absolutely amazing and producing some really, really cool results. By and large, most organizations are practically looking at using machine learning for natural language processing because they have so much text-based data. There are an absolute ton of use cases, but I'll give you the three most common that I'm often find myself conversing with clients around. These are customer self-service. So taking a look at using virtual agents or chatbots to be able to reduce and simplify the customer experience process. This is so, so valuable because it allows organizations to reduce the cost of each interaction when dealing with customer inquiries, which can be massive when you're dealing with organizations that have a huge number of customer inquiries. The other one that I'm often find myself talking about is employee self-service. So this is helping employees to discover the different uh, organizational programs. This might be things like looking at their payroll information, um, collecting performance reviews, and maybe looking at doing sentiment analysis around there, looking at extracting certain entities from different types of documents, corporate knowledge base search. If you think about how much or how many documents each organization has, being able to search through those and discover the right answers is a huge task. Natural language processing can help with that. The last one that I've often find myself working with is a, another use case called agent assist. If you think about a large number of companies, they have experts that are deployed out in the field, helping them discover and search through their corporate knowledge bases to find answers to technical queries. So let's say for example, you've got a, uh, an oil rig, which is out in the middle of the ocean. You don't want to have people trying to fix that particular oil rig and having to go and search through paper-based documents to find the specification for a bolt in order to screw something down. Being able to do corporate search and find specific entities to perform named entity extraction, to be able to find those specific details to help people do their job is another great use case. Alrighty, question five. Hi Nick, I'm a master's in data science student. How, well, what should my GPA be to get a good job? And I want a position as an ML engineer or AI engineer. What should I study for it and where should I focus more? Well, the answer to that, Abhishek, is very clear. Get as high a possible score as you possibly can because the field is ridiculously demanding. That being said, in terms of actually increasing your chances of getting a position in machine learning or AI, I think the most important thing is getting experience and demonstrating what it is that you possibly can do by having a great portfolio and demonstrating evidence of working in the field through different types of projects. This one's coming from Kevin Cranchenblum. Do you think that machine learning has limits besides the lack of data? If yes, what are the limits and how far do we reach them? Great question. Does machine learning have limits? Well, I mean, I guess it depends on what limits you're actually talking about, but Keep in mind that the way to solve different problems isn't always going to be machine learning. There are other techniques that are out there that are able to solve common problems very, very easily. It, you don't always need to use machine learning. That's not to say that you shouldn't use machine learning, it's just that try to use the right tool for the right job. In terms of it having limits, I think it really depends on what you mean. Yes, oftentimes to get to end-to-end -end machine learning projects, you are going to be limited based on the data that you have available. Sometimes you're going to need a model of ridiculous levels of complexity to be able to build something that is able to solve your problem. And if you think about things like general AI, we're still determining whether or not we've got the right infrastructure to be able to do that and whether or not we've got models that are going to be able to scale up to be big enough to do that. This is where things like quantum computing may allow us to have significant steps towards getting to that state. So I think, uh, it really depends on what you mean when you talk about limits, but right now deep learning and machine learning are solving a ton of problems in the real world. 
I think that's probably one of the best things out there. Uh, but keep in mind, there are different tools. So you don't necessarily need to be limited by purely machine learning. Alrighty, we're on to question seven. Many people are saying that I have to be an expert in math to work in the field of deep learning. I see that you don't use any math. I wonder how that is possible. Oh, I think it's just the fact that you don't see what happens behind the scenes, but I do a ton of analysis on the models and a ton of debugging to ensure that I get the models working. On top of that, all of the tutorials that I put out there are made to make it easier for you to get up to speed and build some of these machine learning models. But I actually come from a deep finance background, so I've got my mathematical skills through that basis. So I've gone through the ringer when it comes to learning calculus and algebra and trig and all of those great things. So don't be fooled, I definitely do have a bit of a mathematical background. It's probably not as great as some of the amazing engineers you see out there, but uh, don't take any shortcuts. You definitely still do need math as a foundation to be able to go and do some deep learning. So this one's coming from Don't Even Bother. What are some of the differences between working in the industry and just researching, studying part of ML? For example, one of the things that I've heard is that the data sets aren't always readily available to you. I think one of the massively different things that you'll notice between industry and research is practicality. So oftentimes, even though you're going to see a number of state-of-the-art models out there, clients are more interested in reliability and stability and specifically fine-tuning models to their use case rather than just looking at best practice models that have performed well on ImageNet or Coco. So that is one of the biggest things. Stability, reliability, and maintainability are going to be of a higher priority than producing something which has just been named a state-of-the-art in a research paper. That's not to say that state-of-the-art isn't important, it's just the clients typically have a different emphasis. Research typically has a focus on producing new, novel, and cutting edge ideas to be able to push benchmarks that little bit further. So yes, there is a little bit of a difference in terms of priority. Alrighty, our next question, and this is gonna be the second last one. Remember, we're gonna have a part two to this, so we will be answering some more in the next one. What was my journey from being an economic student to an AI practitioner? So as I've mentioned before, so I did come from a finance background where I didn't necessarily focus on computer science. That being said, I've had a little bit of coding throughout my entire career because it's just something that I've been super interested in. So if you actually watch my video on how I became a data scientist at IBM, I actually go through all of this, but in a nutshell, I actually started out as a graduate at the Reserve Bank of Australia. And as part of that, I worked in the finance team and I started actually just coding things uh, this would be things like maintaining VBA and building Excel spreadsheets. So a large part of it was still working with data, large amounts of data. But over time, I actually discovered this thing called machine learning and figured that, hey, maybe I'd be interested in getting used to that. So very quickly, I actually transitioned out of that role and became a consultant after sitting down and shadowing some of the people that were already doing development within my organization. And just over time, I started implementing different types of data use cases, writing blogs, showing people what was possible in that space. And then I created a YouTube channel. So as a result of creating that YouTube channel, this helped get me a leg up when it came to applying for my job at IBM and the rest is history. Alrighty, the last one and probably my favorite one that I've wanted to answer that nobody's really asked me before. So what is it that I actually do? Like, do you have to code or manage coders or anything like that? This is coming from Don't Even Bother. So my role at IBM is actually a technical specialist. Now, I'm a technical specialist looking after our data and AI team, specifically in the ASEAN ZK region. This means I look after the entire Asia Pacific region for IBM's data science and machine learning technologies. So that's every region excluding Japan, India, and China. Now what this actually means is that I go out to clients each and every day, and this might be virtually, which is why I've got this whole setup around me to help do that a little bit better. I go out to them and I show them how they can leverage best practice and emerging technologies using IBM stack to be able to solve their pressing problems. Now typically I focus on the data science, machine learning and AI space. So this might be showing a client how to build a model to detect risk within their particular organization. I might be using unstructured analysis tools to be able to search through a corporate knowledge base. I might another day be building a computer vision pipeline to help detect defects on a specific piece of machinery. 
Now, the amazing thing about this role is that I get to speak to a large number of clients in a large number of industries, and I get to travel and meet a lot of people, but I also get to work with ridiculously cutting edge tech, which is why I love it so much. Now, this isn't really a traditional data science role. It's really almost like a hybrid between being a client architect and a hardcore developer and a presenter. So there's so much stuff that's actually involved, but it really gets you exposed to a whole bunch of different stuff. And if you love speaking to people, it's an absolutely brilliant role. Hopefully you've enjoyed this AMA. You've been able to get some of your questions answered. Stay tuned for part two. Thanks so much for tuning in guys. Hopefully you enjoyed this video. If you did, be sure to give it a big thumbs up, hit subscribe, tick that bell and let me know what you thought. And if you've got any questions or comments that I didn't address in this video, stay tuned for part two, but also drop them in the comments below or tune into the live streams that we're currently doing every day. Thanks again for tuning in guys. Uh, peace.